I think it's really important that we do not interpret these DNA measures as purely telling us something about someone's biology, because somewhat counterintuitively, genetic data can also tell us about the environment. And there's a couple of reasons for this. The first is that genes reflect the long arm of human history. People who were separated geographically are also different in their cultures, in their experiences of oppression, in the environmental opportunities that they've been allowed access to, and they differ genetically. So when we're comparing people who differ in their genes, we're almost always comparing people who also differ in their environment. We can think about this gene environment correlation operating on a shorter time span too. If you measure my genes, you're also getting some information about my parents who gave me my genes. And you're getting information about the environment that my parents gave me by virtue of their own genetically influenced traits. There is no way to purely purge the environment, even from our ostensibly genetic measures. Not only do genes, genetic differences between people reflect the environment and reflect the long arm of human history, but they also reflect luck. And this is the part that I'm, as a scientist, particularly interested in. When two parents conceive a child, there are 70 trillion possible combinations of their genes that they can pass on to that child, and that child got one. How can we scientifically leverage the randomness of that process in order to figure out how genes are actually causing these differences in life outcomes that we care about? Not only do gene genetic measures reflect the environment, but I think it's also important to remember that genetic measures can change with the environment, or particularly the associations between genetic measures can change with the environment. If any of you are out there watching this presentation wearing eyeglasses, you're already living proof of that. Your genes have affected your eyesight, but we've intervened on that, not by CRISPRing something that's happening in your cells, but by putting lenses in front of your eyes. Um, we see examples of these types of gene environment interactions, or put differently, these environmental interventions or policy changes that change the relationship between our biology and our life outcomes in a lot of different contexts. So for instance, as women got greater and greater access to education in the United States throughout the 20th century, we see an increase in the genetic association with educational outcomes for women. Put differently, what genes you have don't matter nearly as much if you just can't go to college at all. Um, in the US, there's a form of family therapy that teaches parents how to monitor their teenagers' behavior. And what we see is that form of therapy preferentially benefits teenagers who are at high genetic risk for alcoholism. So we haven't changed anything about their genes, but we have lowered their genetic risk for alcoholism by changing their family dynamics. In the UK, there was an educational reform that raised the school leaving age. And what you see is that that changed the relationship between genetic risk for obesity and body size for people who were forced by law to go to school an extra year, people who had a genetic predisposition for obesity were less likely to be overweight in adulthood if they've been exposed to this extra education. All of these are examples where changing something about the external environment, whether it be the family environment, the gender environment, the, the legal policy environment has changed the relationship between people's biology and their health and educational outcomes. So genetics are as strongly associated with many of the social inequalities that we care about. Genetics are not destiny and many of the genetic relationships we can see are modified by the environment. Whether this is deeply controversial or very, very obvious, very much depends on your perspective. When you, in the US, if you ask lay people, so not scientists, to estimate the extent of genetic influence on these types of life outcomes, you see that most people already think that genes do make a difference for where people end up in life. This is um, a figure from my book. It's reproducing data from Emily Willoughby, who's a psychologist at the University of Minnesota, where they've asked a number of people to just say, what's your best guess for how much you think genes influence a variety of traits ranging from um, eye color to height to schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, intelligence, sexual orientation. So what we have on the horizontal axis here is how much lay people, again, not necessarily trained as scientists, think genetic 
makes a difference for these traits. And on the, um, the vertical axis here, we have the published heritability estimate. So the best guess from the, the genetics literature about the extent to which differences between people are due to genetic differences between them. And what I want you to notice here are two things. One is that those two things are related. People are pretty good at guessing what scientists have found out from twin studies about the extent of genetic influence. And the second is that no one's estimate on average is zero. So ordinary Americans already think that genetics makes a difference not just for height and blood group, but also for depression, personality, alcoholism, schizophrenia, intelligence. At the same time, the scientific study of genes and behavior remains controversial, particularly amongst academics, because of its association historically with eugenics and its ongoing misappropriation by white supremacist communities. This fear was put this way by the bioethicist Eric Perrins, Unfortunately, there is an old and perhaps permanent danger that inquiries into the genetic differences among us will be appropriated to justify inequalities in the distribution of social power. The sociologist Catherine Bliss put it slightly more different, slightly differently with reference to um, a 1990s dystopian film with Ethan Hawke. The idea is that we'll have this genetic information everywhere you go. To me, this is really scary. A world where people are slotted according to their inborn ability. Well, that's Gattaca. That is eugenics. So what these scholars are articulating here is a fear that by studying how genetic differences between us are related to life course inequalities, we will wittingly or unwittingly um, seem to give support to eugenic ideology or eugenic policy. Again, Bliss said, this is eugenics. By eugenic ideology, I mean an ideology that asserts the necessity of basing some sort of social order where there's inferior people and superior people based on some reference to their biology. And by eugenic policy, I mean policies such as what we saw in the United States in the early part of the 20th century, where people were forcibly sterilized, where we're um, uh, abridging people's welfare, their freedoms and their resources by appealing to some sort of aspect of their biological inferiority. So this is a real concern. This is a real fear. At the same time, we have a, as you can, I've already seen in this presentation, a burgeoning um, genetic knowledge of how genetic differences between us are related to differences in life, or life course outcomes that we care about. How do we do genetic science? without feeding either eugenic ideology or eugenic policy. In my book, I describe that the alternative to eugenics is not a genome blindness, where we pretend that everyone is genetically the same, or that genetics doesn't make any difference for our lives. Instead, I advocate for articulating what I call an anti-eugenic framework, that for we can both see and understand genetic differences and their relationship to socially valued life outcomes, while also maintaining our political and moral and social commitment to egalitarianism, to political equality between people. So if eugenics thinks of social inequalities as this manifestation of some inexorable natural order and advocates for using genetic information to slot people more efficiently into that order, this is the, the, the fear that Catherine Bliss was articulating in that quote I used earlier. The anti-eugenic framework is reminding us that social systems are always human constructions that work to the benefit of some people and that oppress other people. And that right now, they, those social systems work to the benefit of people who have a certain point, certain embodied privilege, not just the privilege of being born to families with certain resources, but also to the benefit of people who are born with certain types of bodies or certain types of brains. And so our job as anti-eugenicists is to use eugenic information to identify and reduce those social inequalities rather than paint them as inevitable or inexorable. In my book, I described five anti-eugenic principles. And I'm gonna to focus today on the second one, which is using genetic information to improve opportunity rather than classifying people. So if we go back to that example of genetics predicting math course taking, a, a student's polygenic score predicts which math class they're tracked into in the ninth grade, 
and how often, how, how many steps do they persist in math over the course of high school. But that genetic association is moderated by the affluence and advantage of the student's school context. What I'm showing you here is the relationship between polygenic score on the horizontal axis and persistence number of years that you persist in math beyond it being mandatory on the y axis. And what you can see is that the line is flatter for the blue line. The blue line is students from more advantaged schools. So students who are in better schools as measured by their level of resources are buffered from dropping out of math regardless of their level of genetic disadvantage, regardless of being at the low end of that polygenic score distribution. I think this is an interesting way to think about school context. We already think about in both the US and the UK, which schools, which school districts are better at narrowing the gaps that we see between rich students and poor students which mitigate those inequalities that are related to students' starting points in life. And here we're seeing that we can use genetic information in a very similar way. Which schools, which school contacts, which places in the country are better at narrowing those inequalities, not the inequalities due to SES, but the inequalities that are genetically associated. We can take a similar sort of lens to our analysis of interventions. So I briefly already told you about the study that a school um, leaving age reform in the UK on average slightly reduced body size, reduced the risk of obesity and improved physical health for students who had to be in school for that extra year. But it didn't do so equally for everyone. It actually preferentially benefited students who are at high genetic risk for obesity. Right now, we rarely um, interrogate whether or not interventions that are successful on average, are they successful on average, but actually um, promoting what researchers often call a NAFU effect, where the rich get richer, or are they equity promoting interventions? Who is being served by our current roster of interventions and policies? And can we use genetic information as a tool to see whether or not people who are most at risk for poor health outcomes, most at risk for poor psychological outcomes, most at risk for poor educational outcomes are actually being served by the interventions that we have, or are people being left behind? All right, so to sum up, I've given you a lot of information relatively quickly. We know that people's lives turn out differently and increasingly in high income countries, the different domains in which people's lives turn out differently are entangled with one another. The more educated don't just make more money, they also live longer and healthier lives and more psychologically um, happy and satisfying lives. Also, where people end up in life is related to their starting points in life. This is very clear when it comes to the starting point of family income, how, many, how much material resources do people have when they begin life, but it's also true when we measure their starting point in a different way, which is measuring their genetics. Those genetic data aren't just telling us about people's biology, they're telling us about people's environment. And from a scientific, scientific perspective, that's both messy and exciting. We can begin to unravel what are the ways in which genes environments combine to shape how people's lives go. Most people, when we ask ordinary Americans about this type of research, they're not particularly surprised to hear that genetics makes a difference for life outcomes. They already know that. But the topic is, um, is dealt with and treated with a lot of suspicion, and I think rightly so, by academics who fear that it's going to um, foster or breed a sort of eugenic ideology and a return to eugenic policies that we saw in the US and Europe in the 20th century. I think to combat the sort of eugenic ideology and a policy, it's really important for us to not try to sweep data on the rug, under the rug, but instead to articulate an anti-eugenic framework for understanding how can we see genetic differences between people and then accommodate them so that there are multiple opportunities to success within a society rather than trying to ignore that they're there or rather than trying to use them to naturalize the inequalities that currently exist. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions and I, we have tons of time for conversation about this. I'm on Twitter at KPH3K.
You can check out many of my scientific articles on my website, which is kpharden.com. Um, and the book is now available in hardback on um, ebook and an audible audiobook, uh, almost wherever books are sold. And I believe we have a link for you tonight. So I will end there and take questions. Hi, Paige. Thank you so much for that. That was fascinating. We do have lots of questions coming in, but people, please keep sending them in because I love to get through as many as possible. Um, let's jump right in then. So first one comes from Jennifer and they ask, um, you've said that uh, the fear about eugenics lives on in academia. Have you ever had any issues getting funding for your research or are departments becoming more welcoming to genetic research? Um, I've had some isolated difficulty, um, mostly in the private foundation world. Um, it's interesting because in, you know, in the US, the primary federal funders of psychology research are the National Institutes of Health and National Science Foundation. And the National Institutes of Health has actually been very um, enthusiastic about bringing in genetic tools for the study of psychopathology um, and uh, the sort of biological tools that allow you to see how does the social environment get under the skin to affect child health. So my lab has been really generously funded from the National Inst Institutes of Health. And I feel like um, it's, it's kind of an interesting um, uh, uh, sort of disjuncture or like lack of synthesis between different branches of the science. When we're talking about genes and mental health, there's a lot of funding. Um, when we talk about genes and academic achievement, that's where the, where the, um, the, the funding landscape is a little bit more difficult. Interesting. Talking about um, the educational side of it, Nathan has a great question, which is, how do we find a way to apply your research in, in schools and institutions? He says, how do we find a way to talk about the importance of genetics without reinforcing problematic stereotypes? Do you have any ideas about that? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of different routes for this. So mm -hmm. one is not really about applying genetics, but about teaching people about genetics. So if you think about how an ordinary, and again, this is somewhat US dominated my perspective, but I, I think it's probably similar in the UK. So when secondary um, you know, high school students are exposed to genetics for the first time, they often hear about it in terms of like Mendel's pea plants, right? Like this, you know, these, this gene, this is the gene for having wrinkly peas versus, versus smooth peas. Whereas so many of, uh, so much of human genetics is about polygenic influence. So many genes working together in about probabilities, right? So it, it changes the chances, but it's not deterministic and it's working in interaction with the environment. Um, and students are not taught very often about, for instance, why race is not a genetic concept. You know, how do our genes do not map to these social categories of race? So I do wonder how much of our public dialogue about applying this work would be improved if the, you know, starting in an earlier level, like when students are first exposed to biological concepts, if we reoriented our introduction to biology away from this gene four idea and mm -hmm. away from, you know, when we don't talk about race at all with students or with young people, all sorts of misperceptions um, uh, can seep in. If we were explicitly anti-racist and, and, and talking about human genetics in this sort of polygenic probabilistic model of influence, would that improve the dialogue? Um, so there is some initial meta science suggesting that that might be the case, um, and I'm really excited to see where that where that goes to improve the conversation. Hmm. 